great. Uh, hi everyone, oh, here at Online. <laughs> Um, we're very happy to have Dr. Madeline Powell join us for uh, this uh, um, week's riot session. <laughs> um, she uh, has just recently defended her two weeks ago <laughs> the thesis, <laughs> um, uh, and is already, you know, happy to come here and give us a talk. Um, she is currently a lecturer at the University of Leeds. And her work is mostly while look, well, looking at uh, different cognitive changes and processes uh, for women uh, during uh, motherhood period. But she's also a feminist uh, psychologist and a staunch supporter of open and reproducible science. And today to give us a talk a little bit about open science from feminist lens. Thanks. Oh, that doctor is never going to get old ever. <laughs> Um, okay, so if I want to look at people online, do I look into the owl? Is that where the camera is? Um, anyway, the is the screen. Yes, okay, okay. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, this is really, <laughs> this is very strange because this is the first in person talk I've given in like over two years now. So I'm not entirely sure. I don't know what to do with my body, but anyway, um, hello. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about open science through a feminist psychology lens. I'm going to be looking over here rather than up there to try and look at the um, slide so I know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, Maya's kind of introduced me well, um, Dr. Madeline Powell. I defended my thesis two weeks ago, almost to the hour. Um, so I'm early career. I'm a feminist researcher. I'm also a feminist lecturer. I put here I'm in a complicated relationship with open, <laughs> with open science. I'll kind of explain a bit about what I mean by that. So I kind of came to open science spaces um, feeling like it wasn't particularly like a space for me for various reasons that I'll talk about. And now I'm kind of slowly becoming slightly more converted. Um, and I'm a social psychologist. So we've got an hour. I'm hoping not to speak for an hour because that'll be um, fairly boring. And I think it's useful to, for us to have a chat because there's quite a lot that I'm going to talk about that I'm hoping will kind of inspire a bit of discussion. Um, and yeah, these are the kind of things I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to give a very, very brief overview about what feminist psychology is, which is from my point of view, because I don't think it's a static thing. Um, I'm then going to be talking about whether this idea of whether open science and feminist psychology are aligned, whether they like share goals, whether there's tensions. Um, and then I'll be giving some wider insights um, and presenting some data, I've data, which is new. Um, Okie okay, dokie. Okay. So I'm, I think it's important that I'm not going to kind of cover like open science background around like this is reproducibility, this is reproducibility, um, just in the interest of time. But if there is anything as I'm talking, that you're like, don't know what you're talking about, just interrupt or people online, can they unmute themselves? No. I can allow you. Okay, so just shout at me if you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I can cover kind of key concepts as we go. Okie dokie, so what is meant by feminist psychology? Um, I think it's important here that I give a number of kind of definitions because I think that people relate to this concept very differently. So for example, some people view feminist psychology as being really quite kind of intertwined with the psychology of women, um, which is, a, is kind of one view, but I take a slightly different view. Uh, so for some people, identifying as a feminist psychologist means that their research or their scholarship is particularly attuned to kind of gendered issues, particularly um, advocating for the experience of women and girls. For other people, a feminist agenda or a feminist kind of approach to scholarship is far more around kind of questioning um, patriarchal and colonial assumptions about how we do science, how we think about knowledge, about accessibility, equality, inclusion, all of these kind of wider slipperier issues. Um, and I think for me, I really like how Alexandra Rutherford defines it. And she says that feminist psychology is all about questioning the questions. So kind of challenging, taken for granted norms and offering a critical view on dominant discourses. So I think it's important that although a lot of my research is about the experience of women and girls, I don't see feminist psychology and the psychology of women as being synonymous. Um, and we can talk about it a bit more after if you like. But I think that's important. Um, also, just very briefly, um, I wanted to touch upon some of the kind of key cornerstones of feminist epistemology, so feminist approach to knowledge. Um, so feminist psychologists, whether you take the view that it's about uh, psychology of women and about gender or whether it's something bigger, 
is kind of concerned with these sorts of issues. So things like intersectionality and multidimensionality of identity and of experiences, um, particularly the experiences that are gendered or experiences that are kind of rooted in uh, power and hierarchy. Um, criticality, so identifying a dominant norm and providing a kind of alternative perspective. Um, and also particularly interested in research which kind of shines light on issues of inclusivity and representation. Um, and I've already kind of talked about this issue around these two slightly different terms around whether it's about gender or not. So in theory, when I first started thinking about open science, which has only been very recently, because I'm very early career, I just trust that. Um, in theory, I was kind of coming at it from this point of view. So in my mind, I went to a reproducibility kind of boot camp a few years ago, and I was sort of sitting there listening to all these talks about reproducibility and replicability and open data and all this stuff, and thought, in my mind, we're talking about like feminist psychology. Like if we're interested in rethinking knowledge and rethinking how we do science and rethinking how we research, like that is challenging taken for granted norms. Um, particularly when you're trying to open up access. I was like, like open scientists, guys, I think you're feminist psychologists. Um, so, so kind of came into this um, from this point of view. And then the more that I've done a bit more thinking and a bit more talking and a bit more writing, um, I think that it's slightly more complex than that. So I'll kind of cover some of that thinking. Um, so since kind of open science has really taken off, and I'm, oh, I should say that some people say open scholarship, open research. I'm saying open science because that's used what's most in the literature, but I also get that it's beyond kind of STEM. So think of open science as having like an asterisk and also open scholarship, open research. Um, that these were some of the kind of feminist questions that people were having about open science. So there was a special issue in the journal Psychology of Women Quarterly um, that was all about open science and feminist research. It's an amazing, it's all published now. Um, and I contributed two pieces to it. And these were the kinds of questions that people were asking about open science. So within this conversation about open science, who is being included in the conversation? Like whose voices are we hearing? Um, kind of by definition, whose voices is missing? Who is holding the power? So who decides, for example, what robust science looks like, what good science looks like, what science looks like? What structures are governing this? Um, and yeah, who defines what? kind of robust, good, rigorous, important sciences. Um, and I also really like, so Elizabeth Bennett wrote a piece for that special issue. And I love the question that she asked, which is, what does open science mean for research methodologies have been, that have historically been a home for transgressive and radical question asking? And I think that this is the kind of question that I have since been thinking quite a bit about. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the beginning of um, about early career researchers and particularly early career feminist researchers navigating the space because it's kind of what chimes most with my experiences. Um, and it also is a kind of brief summary of a paper that I wrote for that special issue about um, feminist early career researchers. So um, I won't talk too much about ECRs because I think that there's kind of wider issues. Um, but from an early career perspective, I find it fascinating how early career researchers kind of kind of muddling through and navigating um, and in some ways kind of advocating for and leading this open science conversation. Um, so what's really interesting to me is that open science, a lot of kind of open science conversations and tools and initiatives have been like really championed and embraced by people right at the start of their research career, um, which I think is really interesting. So there's a bit of evidence. So um, Chris Chambers reported that around 80% of people who are publishing registered reports are PhD students or early career researchers. Um, there's been a load in the literature around kind of community source, like reading lists and how to guides and events like this and um, like newsletters and conferences and all of this stuff of people who are like really beginning um, their journey in open science. So I think it's interesting how a lot of the open science conversation really feels like a kind of grassroots bottom up, this is our vision for science. Um, however, it's also interesting to consider what that means in the context of the fact that early career researchers 
by definition, I kind of have issues of like powerlessness, um, precarity. So in terms of like job stability and things like that. Um, and also as we kind of try and navigate academia and all of its politics. Um, so what uh, myself and some colleagues of the reference, does this have a thing? No, look, ooh, um, the references at the bottom. Um, what we kind of came together to start writing about is how do we make sure that if open science is being championed by early career researchers, how can we make sure that all early career researchers get a seat at this open science table? And then, <laughs> and then as we were writing this paper, we kind of thought a bit more around, well, is this a table that we want a seat at? Um, and whose table is it anyway? So who is kind of governing this, these spaces and who is restricting um, access. We also thought about this, so this is the paper, um, we also kind of thought about it in terms of if you are an early career researcher who has those issues of um, precarity and power, that if you are coming from a research epistemology or a research point of view that is inherently marginalised anyway, so there's all kinds of evidence which shows how um, feminist research or research around feminist topics is typically viewed as less rigorous, less scientific, less important, um, overly political, overly sensitive, those kind of things. Um, so how do you kind of navigate these conversations around research robustness um, when you are coming from not only a kind of early career point of view, which means that you are kind of bottom of the food chain, if you like, but you're also coming from a, um, or you're doing research that kind of faces trying to advocate for itself as like a legitimate um, research question. So what I thought we'd do, so I've given this talk a few times where I've talked about early career researchers and how we navigate it and I draw a lot of my own experiences um, and a few people have been like okay Maddie cool but like where's the data, where's the data, where's the evidence? Um, so a few of us which I think I mean there's a different talk about why that's necessary but anyway, um, so a few of us got together and this is this paper is in prep and um, it'll be public will be pre-printing like soon next month um, and we basically surveyed a load of PhD students in psychology in the UK and asked them all kinds of questions about their experience of open science how they kind of feel about open science all of this sort of stuff and it wasn't just um, feminist research it was just anyone anyone who's doing a psychology PhD um, so how do they do it? Do they feel like they can actually participate? What do they need? All of this kind of stuff. And I was kind of expecting that it would be a kind of interesting, like, oh, look, people are positive about open science. Um, but some of the qualitative data was, um, it shocked me, so it shocked me. Um, and I think it speaks quite nicely to some of the issues that I'm talking about. So I won't read this whole thing out because that would be really boring for you. But this is what one person was saying in the survey. So we asked them, oh, is, um, is open science, are you interested in it? Is it something that you care about? Um, and there was kind of this, we haven't done a, we just did a content analysis. We've not yet done, or oh, we haven't done anything kind of richer than that. Um, but quite a few people in this sample were talking about like, I kind of get open science, like I get the moral case for it, but currently it is not yet practiced with things like, kindness, a few people talk about compassion, um, there are people online who are horrible to researchers, and there was this, um, really throughout the data, there were all kinds of people who were talking about how um, open science spaces have, have kind of been derailed with this hostility um, and abrasiveness, which creates a real barrier for engagement. And I think that considering if you're then coming from a feminist point of view and you know that feminist research is typically viewed as less scientific and there's been all kinds of cases, particularly on academic Twitter recently around um, research that comes from feminist epistemology being kind of heavily scrutinized and criticized, um, then I think that these kind of issues should be taken really seriously by open science. Um, and I also think that there's this, can you read that? That says research of vulnerability. I think that this, is one of the biggest issues that I don't know if we have yet um, thought enough about in open science spaces. So there is all kinds of um, conversation and thought pieces and commentaries around talking about things like, you know, open data 
are really important and that's going to help us like verify and that's going to help us reproduce and all of this kind of stuff that's wonderful um but i feel like the issue of that with research transparency which is a wonderful thing um it just means that research of vulnerability particularly to that kind of hostile abrasive unkind culture of scientific criticism slash kind of critique um i think unless this is Kind of take kind of taken seriously or at least we acknowledge with transparency comes vulnerability um then this is something that i think is kind of lagging behind in some of our um, open science conversations um and i'd be interested to hear what you think about this at the end because this is something that um yeah i think whenever i kind of have <laughs> coffee with other phd students we talk about this a lot um and i'd be interested you know in terms of like what that looks like for other people um, however, in order to kind of adequately respond to this, then it's worth asking, you know, well, do we have a compassionate, constructive, collaborative culture that is able to account for this, right? Because if we do, then it's fine, because yes, you're vulnerable um, to being like outed or like mistakes, but that's science, you know, that's, that's necessary. Um, but that can only really happen in a meaningful way if we kind of have a culture that knows how to respond to that. Um, enter for open science. So some people really hate this term um, and they hate this term because they think it's kind of problematically gendered and that it's this kind of like men are mean and that's not what this is. That's 100% not what this is. And I think that's an important caveat. So broken science was a term coined by Kirsty Whittaker and Olivia Guest that started an all good things do on Twitter. Um, <laughs> and then um, they wrote a piece for a psychologist and now it's kind of in the sort of language of open science. And they basically were, it's a really uh, nice piece in The Psychologist. They were basically talking about this culture of hostility and unkindness and elitism that can often be found in open science discourses. Um, so it's kind of like this idea of open data, I think uncritically um, promoting the idea that all of your data should be open, I think is, is a, is a legitimate and fine thing, but only if you then kind of acknowledge, well, what culture is this existing within? Um, and yeah, I think that this whole idea of like broken science and knowing how we are kind of fixing how we engage in scholarly criticism, um, I think is really necessary. Because it's like with open data. Yes, open data is a wonderful thing because it means that we can detect errors, it means that we can reproduce each other's stuff, like it's just a good thing, it's good for transparency. Um, but there's also this tension that I don't think near enough people are talking about around the tension between what is good for science and what is good or bad for scientists or researchers. Um, and a few people have said to me, like, well, you know, Maddie, that science, like it's not about you having a nice time, feeling comfortable. It's about the science being good. Um, but I would just like wholeheartedly and actively reject that idea um, because I think that the science that we do needs to come from a place of compassion, please. Um, <laughs> and I think that a lot of these kind of like broken science discourses and spaces don't help. Um, but we could talk about that a bit more. And this is another quote from the survey that we ran, bearing in mind that there was no kind of like prime of like, tell us about the hideous times you've had with open science, it was just what do you think? Um, and someone was talking, and this came through quite a bit, around open science as being daunting, it's reserved for geniuses doing perfect experimental studies, um, and people generally saying around how kind of, um, oh, I don't really know if this is something for me and this is if this is where I fit. And it's also really interesting, and maybe we can talk about this because it's completely beyond the scope, around how open science has kind of become a bit of a sort of academic identity and I'm really fascinated by that you know that this, it's like are you an open science person or not whereas what we're talking about is doing good rigorous research and I think that there's possibly some like social identity work to be done maybe we should do that anyway um around like how open science <laughs> it's 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 an important part of some people's academic identity um but also what interests me here is people saying um, I'm not quite clear on how it, being open science, applies to the sort of research I'm doing, so like qualitative research. And this is something that I also think is um, something interesting to consider. So I've called this epistemological battlegrounds, which 
that feels a bit dramatic now. Um, but this is something that I've been doing a lot more thinking about. So, okay, so we know that open science has kind of been dominated by these kind of issues. So reproducibility, rep, 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 that word, transparency. And what's really interesting to me is about how what is happening in kind of recent year years is some people are um, doing really good progress in trying to apply the open science tools and practices we have to other research paradigms. So for example, exploratory research, qualitative research, um, more like creative based methods. And what kind of my view is, or something that I've been thinking a bit more that I'm writing about at the moment, is that there's kind of two ways of doing it. You can either apply what has create, has come from experimental quantitative research methods and try and kind of translate it to, for example, qualitative methods. Or I think there's this wider issue about whether the original tools and practices are kind of like epistemologically relevant or epistemologically um, compatible with all research paradigms. So like, for example, let me try to explain what I mean. So like open data, we use that example before, open data, is a good thing. There's a lot of kind of um, increasing like mandates on open data and open data availability statements, and that's wonderful, which is great for quantitative data. It kind of makes sense. But if we think about what the point of open data is, like if it's about, for example, people being able to reproduce findings, then that isn't a concern of qualitative data or a lot of qualitative data. So qualitative researchers wouldn't necessarily kind of promote the idea that another researcher can reproduce their findings if we think that things like research positionality, reflexivity form such an important part about how qualitative research gets analysed. Does that make sense? Um, so what I really kind of um, have been like trying to advocate for a little bit more is trying to um, step away from using the Kind of values and standards of quantitative research in open science and kind of directly trying to apply them to other paradigms um because there are i think in terms of like how you view knowledge and research they don't always exactly uh mirror each other yeah if we, if we can talk about this a bit more at the end because i think that this is a, a point that i have like way more to say on um, but maybe we can talk about it at the end particularly the idea of like well is reproducibility a a concern for qualitative research, for example. I think there's um, another issue that is also this kind of speaking to the sort of tension between um, the goals of open science and kind of what it stands for, and feminist psychology and what actually happens on the ground. Um, and this is the kind of issue of like much wider accessibility. So I think a lot of the open science discourses have been um, situated in kind of the UK and the US in very, um, very specific cultures and contexts. And yet we can't really talk about open science unless we, we mean open, unless we mean open to everyone, universal, open, access, accessible. Um, so we know that like researchers who, for example, live in our work in the global south face, face really unique challenges of infrastructure and access that goes well beyond what I think we've currently started talking about in terms of accessibility of research um, so far. There's also, this is kind of beyond like the geographical point, I think there's also um, really important issues in early career researchers in terms of like um, support and buy-in and trying to get access to open science um, tools and practices and kind of know how to do it. Um, so I speak to early career researchers all the time who are like, I'm fully on board, I get the moral case, I get that this is a good thing, but I do not have access to knowing how to do that. Um, and I think trying to think about how these two things can be um, dealt with, um, I think as I see as being one of the, the biggest priorities for open science moving forward. And there's also, so I've, I've been thinking about this issue a bit more. Um, so I've done quite a bit of work, side note, I've done quite a bit of work recently about hidden curriculum in higher education. So in, usually in like an undergraduate student context, so what do students need to know in order to kind of successfully do their degree? And if we don't actually teach it, how do we expect them to know it? Um, so what's the curriculum that is just assumed 
or implicit that we don't actually ever spell out to them. Like if no one tells you what a lecture is, how on earth are you supposed to know what a lecture is, for example? And I think that there's a real hidden curriculum of open science. I think that there's a lot of kind of assumptions around knowledge or kind of implicit um, things that we assume that people know, um, which I just think is being, it just exacerbates hierarchies and it promotes or kind of perpetuates it is inaccessibility or not not being accessible um and i think that there's also this um this quote here which i think is just absolutely beautiful i think it sums up so much of what i want to say around how openness is an, in an instrument to mobilize power and i guess what i'm trying to say in like this whole talk is that we can't view open science and conversations about research integrity and about reproducibility and robustness we can't think of those as being kind of apolitical or as being not entrenched entrenched within the very real very powerful hierarchies that exist in academia and indeed in the world more generally and i really like this idea as well around we must interrogate whose interest is open openness serving and who is it neglecting um so what i would kind of really um appreciate is a kind of slowing down of open science i'll talk about this in a little bit so trying to kind of slow down and instead of slap mandates on things around like make your data open um to think a bit more around like who is governing this process and who's by whose definition um are we using when we talk about robustness and we talk about good science so these are my <laughs> I fixed i fixed the problem here are my three um <laughs> some of my three ideas these, these are just some kind of uh introductory ideas because sometimes i present this stuff and then people say at the end the first question is always so what should we do next um and these are just some of my early ideas um so i've said in the open science buffet i i 100 plagiarized this idea from somebody but i don't think i couldn't find anyone wrote about it so it might have been a tweet um it's where i get most of my information if you haven't picked up already it's twitter um so somebody um or maybe it's just one of those cultural things that's anyway um talked about trying to move from openness or open science as being kind of you need to do all of these practices if your research isn't pre-registered if your data isn't open if you haven't done it as a registered report etc cetera, etc cetera, then it's bad to try and move to thinking about open science as a buffet so by this i mean that instead of it being a kind of one size fits all do all of this stuff early career researcher feminist researcher um to try and uh encourage researchers to pick the bits of open science that makes the most either methodological epistemological research career logical sense um so instead of trying to have this kind of idea that you have to be doing all of these different tools and practices um to instead move away to a kind of culture that's like to take what makes sense um, so open data for example might not make sense for your research goals and that's that's okay um i also this is quite a big one so i don't think we can do this right now but i also really welcome much more kind of inclusive wider ideas around like what do we mean by robustness um and what do we mean by good research and also where is our idea of like good research come from um like if you're doing community engaged research using creative methods um doing really kind of like partnership exploratory type work like who is to say that that is less rigorous or robust than other methods um and i think even just having a kind of heavy caveat on a lot of open science tools and practices that this is a tool and practice, but it is coming from an assumption that that indicates um, that the research is more robust. I would really like a kind of more caution to be applied on mandates for this type of thing, because I think that there's really legitimate reasons why a lot of these tools don't work for different researchers. Um, my other one, and this would actually be number one, because it's one of these things, is I think one of the ways forward is to to just like just slow down, slow down, guys. It's particularly slow down critique. So there's all kinds of um, really good uh, papers and discussion points and people talking about slow science or slope in science. All that I thought was cool um, around like let's slow down the science, let's do it more rigorously, let's do collaborative science instead of just kind of like churning out 
quick and dirty studies with small sample sizes. But I think what is currently missing is applying that principle to how we engage in scholarly critique. So um, I wrote some, I should have put the reference, I'll send the link anyway. I wrote something with Karina Hurst, who's at Sussex, for the psychologist, where we were basically arguing for, or we were basically highlighting that there is a huge disconnect with the principles of slow, considered, thoughtful science and how we then kind of respond to each other's science or how we then engage in discussion and critique and kind of scholarly criticism, which is usually, um, for example, on Twitter, um, very fast, very kind of like quick, fast, short, this is what I think. And there's been instances in um, the past couple of years of particularly feminist early career researchers really being caught up in the problem of slow science and fast critique, which I think taking it back to the kind of, um, some of the quotes that I presented, I think that that is, um, is harming researchers. So I would really like to see a lot more constructive, compassionate and slower approaches to how we engage with one another's work. Um, and I think that that's as important as conversations around like methodological rigor. And I think that that's all I was going to say. Oh no, there's more reading. Um, so the, yeah, so I talked about the special issue of psychology of women. It's also really ironic to me that it's the psychology of women quarterly. I would have preferred to be feminism in psychology anyway, because of what we talked about at the beginning. Anyway, um, but there's some really, really lovely papers that are talking about issues of feminist psychology and like open data, feminist psychology and ethics, how we think about where we get data from, how we apply kind of, um, like one of them was around uh, like survivor led discourses and how people use online data for an open site, it's really interesting. Um, and also just to flag that some other work that I did in this space was some work with Dr. Sophia Pearson, who's at um, Leeds Beckett University, where we were talking about how open science um, could actually be a really good ally to feminist researchers because it allows us to challenge some of the problematic dominant discourses in, for example, we were talking about some of the issues with brain sex difference researchers um, and about how there's a lot of research that's like, who's got a better brain, men or women or whatever. And we were saying that actually in this instance, um, there could be a lot that feminist scholars and feminist psychologists take from open science because it allows um, quite a rigorous reappraisal of um, dominant ideas in psychology. So just to flag that as well. Um, also just to flag, so I've put here FORT. So FORT is the framework for open and reproducible research training. Um, I do a lot of work with FORT because um, one of my kind of other big loves is thinking about how we can apply these kind of conversations to the curriculum um, in a particularly undergraduate research skills curriculum. Um, and if that is something that interests you, this kind of stuff, then let's chat because there's a couple of upcoming FORT projects um, that I'm working on around trying to embed kind of suitably critical perspectives on open science across the undergraduate curriculum. Um, and this is the editorial that came with the special issue. It's just beautiful, it talks through all the papers. Um, and I think that was everything that I wanted to say. Um, there's my Twitter, there's my email address. And these are the lovely people who helped collect the data that I presented. Um, and I, we've got a nice chunk of time for questions and thanks. Now is the time for questions. We're going to play the questions and then also kind of chat with the people. Oh, yeah, first question and then, yeah, and then uh, so like, I can allow people to talk on webinars. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, Shall I stop sharing my screen? Oh, uh, no, just okay. leave the screen there. Okay. I think that the sound is down, so we should be able to hear people. Like maybe very loudly. Okay. Yes. <laughs> There'll be like a booming voice. Yeah. I think also <laughs> the but yeah. Oh yes. I just want to correct you for one. What is meant by early career researchers? Is there like a definite category? Is there the year under which one can be very good or privileged? That's a really good question. Um, and this is something. So when we were when we wrote that paper, we were like early career researchers. And then we, the first thing was like, what do we mean? So 
There are, it kind of depends who you ask. So people like, uh, like the BPS and APA have very specific, like you are classed as early career when you are like X years post PhD, but like the BPS is five, APA is seven. It all, it all feels a bit arbitrary. Um, but how we defined it or how I kind of define it is, um, I guess, A, people who self-identify as being early in their careers, which I think feels kind of fair. Um, and also kind of more broadly, um, there's some people who talk about early career as being specifically people who are affected by like precariousness. So people who are not yet on established contracts. Um, but I guess for me, I think it's about, um, I think it's about identity. I think some people um, identify as being like right at the start of their career and some people don't at different stages. So in the, we have a thing in the paper because a reviewer was like really interested in this. Um, um, yeah, we kind of go through like, oh, the APA says this, BPS says this, but we're talking generally around how people self-identify. Um, yeah, does that kind of answer your question? That's a really good question. I did have a slide in my topic, I thought it was going to run out of time. Um. <laughs> One question from Mark Rubin. Um, oh. I also like the fake uh, approach. It takes the pressures off, and I like the sloping science idea, <laughs> uh, but these approaches don't seem to fit well with the idea that there is a replication crisis mm. um, and that we urgently need to fix science. So isn't the slower pick and flex approach going to be met with resistance because it is seen as slowing down the reform movement? Mm. Oh, that's interesting. So like, actually, we don't have the kind of um, affordance of doing things really slowly because everything is so much on fire and everything's so hideous and we need to urgently fix it um yeah i think i mean i don't see like slowing down of science as being like necessarily problematic in that way because i think that part of the reason why we have a replication crisis if you crisis because some people don't like crisis is because things have been done historically like way too quickly and way too like unthoughtfully um so i think one of the i don't know if this answers the question but just as an aside i think one of the most positive i think kind of ways forward of like open science is this move to do much bigger like collaborative team science and that that is because i think that's a nice example of where yes it takes a bit longer because there's more people um but it's more around like drawing on expertise and doing things well and doing things rigorously and having kind of meaningful sample sizes um and i guess yeah trying to move away from this idea of like genius researchers who like do stuff on their own um but yeah I th i've never really thought about like that actually i think that, that's a really interesting idea like is can we afford to be slow in our science if things are so kind of bad um yeah i just think that the my view is that a lot of the real like yeah replication issues have come from um, a focus on outputs and a focus on like generating lots of science quickly and i think that in fixing things to think about it as being a slightly slower version that surely that will just mean that we we have good enough evidence to be able to speak meaningfully to the replication crisis um does that kind of answer the question does anyone else have any thoughts on that by the way because i think that's a that's an interesting point like should we be trying to urgently fix um or kind of urgently trying to run lots of replications to see what is replicable or should we be concentrating efforts on like bigger fatter science rather than like individual efforts when there are recent reports about how some of the replication studies also had different flaws yeah so i would say um, we also need to be very cautious how we do replication, mm. so, so as to avoid um, well, criticism of the replication studies happening as well. Yeah, and that's a really good point. There was a paper in the special issue um, that was really good, really good. It was by uh, Natalie Savick, where they did a reanalysis of you know the 2015 Open Science Collaboration, da, 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 and they were looking at it through a um, intersectionality lens and they were like but although there's these replication attempts the um like basic demographic data for participants was almost like not not existent so they were kind of saying that there's all these wider issues of you know like 
who are our participants, who are we expecting is going to replicate, who is like, do we really think that there is like some default human who, <laughs> who is kind of standard across studies. Um, so yeah, I think that's, a, that's also a really good point that I think, and I think it requires like slowing down to think about all of these different issues, um, even in the, the big kind of important replication work. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, um, did that answer the question? I don't know if it's like a follow-up so. comment. Um, because Mark Rogan responded that it's like, the there's oh, yeah. so many different legal ways to explain slope and slain. Also, I, I, I like the, the idea about being more collaborative, mm. just because then you don't just rely on like a small group of people just deciding everything. And once that combined with being quick, then that open up like more the less thoughtful full process where you have everyone. Well, there's also debatable whether or not when you have a big group, there's also the issues around someone might, you know, social loafing. Yeah. And the, but then you have everyone kind of trying it at the same time. And I kind of like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had a really good um this is like anecdota, sorry, but I had a really good experience with like a collaborative project recently where we wanted to review the evidence that embedding open science in the curriculum might confer, I was going to say benefits, might impact student outcomes. Um, and this started off being me and like three other people. And I was like, let's write a narrative review and yeah, let's do that. And then it got bigger and bigger. We ended up with 75 of us <laughs> from all over the world. It was massive. And we ended up doing a full systematic review in like a quarter of the time. Um, and we were doing the systematic review and we're doing the um, like title and abstract screening. And I said to everyone, oh, we'll, we'll allow two weeks for this process. That might be a bit tight. Mm. And after, I think it was like 48 hours because everyone sort of did like one or two, it was, it was done. And it was the most kind of rigorous, like really tight because some people had expertise in systematic reviewing some people are expertise in um like the reliability thing kappa whatever i don't know um and it was all stuff that was way outside of my expertise but meant that with all this kind of like pick and mix everyone do their bit um it creates something that just could not have been possible with me and the three people who started um but yeah did you have a question uh, i just thought that again i like the idea of collaboration but then could it in a way be exacerbating or on the other hand helping decrease the hierarchies within academia that the co collaborations are usually going to be across a spectrum of status stata of researchers? Mm. So does that get, do you think in your opinion, is that going to help the struggling researchers like getting in contact with more established researchers and get like on a clearer path or is good at on the other hand like make the hierarchy of mm, I think it's yeah I think that's a really good point it's a really complex issue because I guess it's also that thing around by collaboration with all these like hundreds of people who is actually doing like the bulk of the sort of labor and <laughs> is it just a case of like, oh, great, we can get PhD students to do all this boring stuff and it's collaborative. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we write about in the paper is around the issue of like um, the kind of hidden labor or like unappreciated labor that a lot of early career researchers do in kind of in the name of open science. Um, and I think that I think that it is I think there's all, there is that kind of risk that it's like who is is this an equal division of labor um but then i think there's also really promising things like the uh like credit statements which start what's credit start with uh, contributor roles something taxonomy does anyone know what it means yeah. yeah that thing um which i think is like i see that as being a really feminist thing because i'm like you're thinking so much broader around what contribution to a project means and being really transparent with who did what um but then I guess the thing around collaboration is, is also it's not yet like culturally from um, particularly in early career research, particularly in like the UK, there's also tensions with. So, for example, there's some PhD students or even the fact you know, like a PhD has to be like your own work. And some there's some PhD rules and regulations around to what extent you can do collaborative work in a thesis and stuff like that. that I think 
potentially create some barriers. Um, I don't, uh, I think I lost the train of that thought. But yeah, I think that there's always the risk of like unequal division of labor and also the risk of who is getting access to those like opportunities. So sometimes I see these papers and it's right in my area and there's like hundreds of authors. And I think, oh, when was that conversation happening? Because that's really cool. And, and, and I, it's, yeah, trying to kind of, I guess, like democratize access to those kind of collaborative opportunities as well, which is also why things like FORT, the framework for open and, open and reproducible research training um, is so nice because it has a big ethos on like sharing opportunities for collaboration. Um, yeah, does that answer that question? I don't know if it <laughs> went slightly off on one, but yeah. Is that your hand? Yeah. So I was I was wondering because I, I, I really resonated with the what you were saying about how um, especially early careers feel like they're going to be you know targeted by you know long term mm. divide hours and so on mm. and I feel like whether your thoughts may be that what is missing in the open science is that science should be a learning process as yeah. the ECR are learning you're not it kind of promotes now the idea I'm this genius. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what is the best analysis and that's for this data. And then I register that and then I do it. But if we are actually seeing science more as a learning process where I learn to do reviews or I learn to do review process, for instance, or I learn on Twitter or somebody that actually I should have done this. And then mm -hmm. instead of that actually report, here is the, how I started, where I ended, what was in the process I was learning. Yeah. That way we could, get more people on board and, and reduce the barrier for many early careers of, you know, seeing it as the learning process, we learn how to do better instead of saying, oh yes, now I know exactly this best possible thing to do with this data set. Yeah, exactly. Because there was, I think like someone said in a talk once to me, because I was saying, I did that thing around like vulnerability and transparency. And they were like, oh, well, maybe PhD students just shouldn't be able to publish. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, no, no, because they were like, oh, well, until you are established, until you know what you're doing, maybe you shouldn't be contributing to the literature. And I was like, ah, ah you've not, you've not quite got it. Um, and also because I think it's this really interesting thing that I've grappled with a lot in the past like two weeks around like expertise, that it's like, it's a bit like we were talking about how you define early career, the like <laughs> the day that you get your PhD doesn't mean like I don't have any more expertise now than I had two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this, yeah, that like it's a learning process. And also I think that there's also this thing around how we can like update thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like some people, like for example, in qualitative analysis, um, like Brown and Clark 20, 2006 is like the paper for thematic analysis that's like that's the thematic analysis paper that everyone cites but Brown and Clark have also said quite a lot on Twitter they're like stop citing that because our, our ideas have changed and our ideas have developed and actually the a lot of that kind of still rings true but the way that we think about doing this type of analysis our thinking has moved on so it's like oh but see 2019 and, and, and it trying to kind of allow space in science and research generally for like not only getting things wrong and being like oh I shouldn't have done it like that but also like updating your thinking um I think is really important um and yeah and I guess it's that like I think one of the biggest issues is that whole like broken science thing because it should be um you know if you publish something and even if there's not like an error but it's like oh I should have maybe I should have thought about the data slightly differently um that I don't yet think that there is a culture that can respond to that in a way that's not like hideous. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, oh, sorry. Can I bring some of the online questions? Mm. So I'm going to allow someone to talk. Hopefully. You can hear them. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. That's been a really interesting talk. Thank you so much, Maddie. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of how we can shift power. Um, I guess there's an emphasis on PhD students being in charge of open science and being kind of in the way now that, you know, you can start your career in an open way. Um, but that kind of feels like it's uh, putting the emphasis in the wrong place. But mm -hmm. I can agree with you that 
um, the really like harsh recriminations of, you know, getting open science wrong means that everyone ends up worse off. So I've, I'm interested in the idea of how we can shift the power um, while also not kind of creating a system where PhD students get um, critiqued and sort of um, overly harshly responded to when they make open science mistakes. Mm, that's a really, really, really good question. Um, because it's also like in the uh, data that I presented, there was so much around like, yes, I want to do this, but kind of I have to do what my supervisor says, and my supervisor says no. So what do I do with that? And I think that there's also this wider issue um, that relates to that of when open science becomes kind of rightly embedded in like incentive structures and like job adverts and all this stuff that's like you need to have experience when we know that early career researchers experiences are so heavily governed by their advisors and supervisors. Um, I think that there are some really promising progress so because <laughs> it kind of in like a nice way like I think it's well-meaning but sometimes it irritates me slightly where there's all like kind of webinars or papers that's like hey PhD student this is how to do open science or like this is why you should do open science and because there's so many people that I speak to who are like well I know but I don't have the power in this situation um but there is some useful progress like there was a really lovely paper published really quite recently in Calabra that was around what can senior researchers do to support their um PhD students with open science and I feel like that slight shift in narrative feels so important um, because instead of it being like how do we um, kind of encourage PhD students to like fly the flag and like kind of shout up the ladder like hey I think I want to do this and instead focus on kind of how to I don't know if it's like upskilling or whether that's too kind of paternalistic, but how to kind of support senior academics in supporting their students. I think that that is the, the switch that I would like to see. Because um, I also agree that I think there's, you know, I'm an early career researcher and I think that there's um, so much around open science tools and practices that I'm fully on board with, don't have an idea of how to do it um, and trying to kind of break this hidden curriculum of open science and put the agency and kind of focus back on the people who have the power to support early career researchers, I think is um, the solution or a solution. Um, does that kind of speak to what you mean? Sorry, I don't know the name of who was speaking because it doesn't say, um, but I think that that's a really important point. So I'm gonna go with some, uh, my body, uh, someone in person audience and then go back to Thomas, if that's okay. Yes. Um, so I was just wondering, a lot of the first flaws of open science that you mentioned sound to be possible to fully blame on the culture. Mm. Do you feel like there are any inherent flaws in open science or is it like fully fixable because it's just the culture is about how we interpret it and we can just reflect on it and then keep and sometimes it's going to be fine. Where is your inherent? So by inherent, do you mean like what individuals are doing? In the idea of open science, like if just like some parts of open science cannot be fixed. Oh, that it's like, let's just stop doing that with open science. Yeah, I know. I think I feel like the biggest thing for me is not necessarily that there's open science things or like tools that I'm like, let's scrap that because that's kind of not helpful. I think it's more around how, I think we're rushing to apply some of these open science tools and practice to everything. And I think what we are lacking is just nuance. So it's like there's um, there's been all kinds of conversations about pre-registration specifically, where some people are like it's good, some people are like it's terrible. And I think allowing that like actually the space for, for some people it's good, for some people it's terrible, depending on what your research is, depending on what your epistemology is, how you view knowledge. And I think that the one thing that I would just like to urge caution to science, if science is listening, is like to try and break away from the kind of like mandated universals, like kind of checklist of like, you need to do this stuff or your science isn't robust. And also bringing it back to epistemology, like that is, Sort of the buzzword of my talk and it always annoyed used to annoy when people used to say because i'm like no one knows what that means stop saying epistemology but i think thinking about like 
your how you view knowledge and how you view research and what your research question is and then thinking about what open science practices make the most sense rather than the other way around um i think that is the way of kind of slightly fixing some of the issues maybe hi there uh, can you hear me yes Okay, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you. That was a really fantastic talk. I particularly appreciated uh, your points about qualitative research um, and uh, the issues of positionality and things like that. That was really cool. Um, my question is about, you know, you mentioned that there's some concern about how open science can often be intimidating to people, maybe in part uh, based around kind of the harshness of criticism that often comes up. And uh, I wonder, do you think this is at least partly because open science issues have become quite moralized issues? Uh, people talk only semi facetiously about, you know, the seven deadly sins of, uh, of, of bad practice and so on. Uh, what might feminism have to say about this sort of moralization of open science? Oh, that's really, that is really interesting. And that isn't something that I've thought like a massive amount about. Um, that's right. I guess it's also it kind of goes back to like what good science means and like what is doing science well and how a lot of these conversations are actually wrapped up in like, you know, if you do this, then your science is good and your science is credible. And I think stuff around I mean, like, I guess feminist psychology as well has thought quite heavily about issues like credibility and expertise and trying to shift the focus away from like researchers are the experts and they do research on <laughs> they do research on people who aren't experts and instead of trying to you know like advocate for more kind of I guess the more what's is there a word for arrogant that's not arrogant trying to shift away from maybe just like arrogance around like oh that you're a researcher and therefore you can say something more meaningful and insightful about someone's experiences than they can say um so I guess that, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have like a direct answer to that question because it's not really been something that I've ever like thought huge about, but I think it does come wrapped up in issues of who is credible and who is a credible voice. And um, that I think that the kind of, a lot of feminist research does kind of like, yeah, creative, um, collaborative, like community-based, creative-based research, which I think doesn't necessarily come with the idea of like, there are experts and there are non-experts um because i guess that the kind of moral issue also speaks to that around like what is good and what is bad and who gets to decide um i mean i don't know was it thomas who was saying i don't know if you have any like wider thoughts on that or because it's not really been something that i've thought about but i think there's i, I completely get what you're saying yeah um well so i'm not gonna i certainly won't pretend to be super familiar with uh, feminist philosophy i wish i i did know more about it but i wondered whether there's you know scholarship in that area about sort of feminist perspectives on morality and i think maybe you're already kind of touching on it with this idea of a more maybe relational approach for example to, to moral problems as opposed to a highly agentic sort of if you do the bad things you're a bad person um mm. kind of mindset I think that there's the one thing I can think about. So in the um, in the special issue, I really like the special issue. I think it's just, it's just really good. That there, there's a really interesting paper about ethics and about trying to apply um, a feminist psychological lens to how we think about ethics. And there was so there's one paper about ethics. It's another where they're talking about um, how there's a lot of research which uses like online data. So they were talking about like hashtag Me Too data, um, and people use that data and they kind of anonymize it and use it and analyze it and they were trying to kind of advocate for like can we think about this differently and think about like is it right to use data in that way who is it serving and I guess like asking some of those questions like I had in the um quote around like who's interested this serving sorry I'm like speaking to the owl like the like <laughs> like the owl is the person so that's where the camera is um like who's interested this serving and who's um who's at risk, I guess. So I guess in terms of like reading, I could maybe share the um, papers, but it was in Psychology of Women Court, mostly 2021. And the, yeah, there was a paper around, it's really good paper around uh, use of Me Too data and whether that's appropriate. And I guess that kind of wraps up with like morality and 
if we if a data is open does that mean that it's moral and right to use it i guess um which is was kind of looked at through a lens of feminist psychology and also wider issues of like ethics and applying like feminist ethics of care to how we think about data as well but they were my the sort of best readings i can give you yeah that's awesome uh could you just uh remind me what that paper is that you're referring to i wouldn't mind uh, um yeah so it'll be in um I can like maybe find the link and like share it with you after, but it's in um, so the psychology of women quarterly special issue on feminist psychology and open science tensions and possibilities, um, and one of the papers around um, survivor informed analysis of the Me Too movement data, and one of them is called like challenges and tensions with feminist psychology and um, ethics. Um, but if you can't find them, just my email address is there. There, so. Um, just drop me a, a note and I can send you them as well because they're really good and they'll they'll give a better answer than I can give. Thank you so much. Okay. Maybe I think I want to ask a question. So I um so I found I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of like um I, I do agree with the points about not mandate people because not that many people can because a lot of times when we put rules in place and I know that in the UK uh, context specifically, what I like about the UK system is that everything, if something that is identified as good, then it's going to reservation. Mm -hmm. Whereas I came from a more US context, which is, is mostly still rely on the practices of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, and it has issues of um uh what is it inequality in and of itself because only certain labs can have the resources and also the time mm -hmm. to engage with open science practice whereas here it's going to re uh, regulations and there's a lot of good things that UKRN is doing mm -hmm. um so but I can see your point that we shouldn't just mandate and um but how can we then move toward still not forcing that people have to implement certain practices but still highlight accountability from mm -hmm. the researchers so they see their responsibility that they need to produce credible data yeah i think i think that that's a really like i completely get your point because it's like like if your data avail availability statement is like ask me and i might have the data sorry you know then then we need to just need to kind of fix that because that's not a data availability statement um i guess it comes back to trying to widen the idea of like really legitimate reasons to opt out and i think that that's probably like a solution because i think that you can have well if you have whether it's a mandate or whether it's like or if you say not all not all papers need open data but all papers need a line about data availability um, and trying to be really specific with what counts as legitimate and what counts as illegitimate, particularly, and I think that this thing around kind of legitimate opting out being, um, you know, with things like, well, if reproducibility just isn't, isn't hugely like a concern for the time of research you're doing, or if, like, you know, there's loads of qualitative data that just can't be shared, just can't be shared because uh, because it's sensitive, because it can be identifiable, because for whatever reason, um, and I think kind of widening the lens to take that really seriously and, and acknowledge, oh, it's not like a bad paper that doesn't get a badge because, and that means it's bad because it doesn't have open data, but that there are kind of really importantly legitimate reasons why someone not just can't do that, but why it's not appropriate for them to engage in that. So. I definitely think it's a tension of like accountability and how much is kind of legitimate ways of opting out will that be kind of like sort of you like i was gonna say weaponized i don't mean weaponize that people would like draw on that incorrectly um but yeah i guess it's allowing space for nuance and trying to widen the scope to view legitimacy of not engaging in all of these practices um is probably what I would like to see more of. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm. And do you feel like, because one thing that as I listen to you talking, and I also realize that a lot of us here are mostly early career, well, early, I, I hesitate to call myself early career now just because I'm kind of like new to work, but, but a lot of us is also kind of earlier. Mm. <laughs> 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 Whereas I think this conversation would be more helpful 
if we can have more of the senior people mm -hmm. engaging right so that we can because i think a lot about the team the internal times and work really as well mm. um whereas it seems like senior people are the one that decide on policy senior yeah. people decide on all the things that can be implemented in this incentive system but then we are the one that engage in mostly the, yeah. the conversation so um yeah yeah i know what you mean because i also kind of slightly reject this idea or not reject it but have issues with the idea that like early career researchers not only have you got to do your phd which by the way is a really hard thing to do but you've also got to be like a change maker and like pave the way and like advocate and i feel like <laughs> there isn't enough talking about like that is a really difficult partially soul destroying thing to do to be you know like be the change and i'm like well can't mine oh, not mine but like can't the change come from like top down so i think that that's why i have i have a tricky issue with some of the kind of incentives and mandates and being put into policy because i think it's i think it's necessary because i think it takes the emphasis off like early career researchers shout up the ladder but then also it needs to be done in a way that allows for this kind of nuance that we're talking about um but yeah i think whenever i like speak about this stuff um I think it's, it's always the same <laughs> that there's all these early careers that just like really grappling with these issues um and i'm like like the wrong people are in the room sometimes you know um but yeah i think i agree so there's no other question but if you want really appreciate that the talk today might be I guess we can, I mean, it's already up so fast, the fast time. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, oh my, sorry, I didn't think it time. <laughs> sorry, you've all got lives to lead, I will, no, I'll stop talking. Time. <laughs> so, thank, you, thank you everyone for joining online and in person. <laughs> um, and I think we'll post this. Um, um, yeah, this is recorded, so the video will, the be, video will be also available. Later. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for coming, thanks for coming, our people. <laughs> and yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. Oh. Thing as well, that's the thing that I haven't heard for like two years. <laughs> like, oh, it sounds so nice. <laughs>